Please stand as you are able for the reading of the scripture. The first reading for this morning is from 2 Corinthians, chapter 5, verses 6 to 10 and 14 to 17. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. Second reading is from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 4, verses 26 to 34. He also said, This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or get up, gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it, because the harvest has come. Again, he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants, with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them, as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. But when he was alone with his disciples, he explained everything. May God bless the reading, hearing, and understanding of his word. Amen. You may be seated. So as we begin our... Uh... Our message time, because our message time is this wonderful Ask a Pastor, uh, I do need to, uh, uh, to mention one other thing before we begin, and I'm going to ask that you would pray with me, because uh, the wreath that is standing behind us here uh, is from a celebration of life from Michael Hahn, uh, Dan, Dan Hahn's brother, uh, that we celebrated over the weekend. And so would you join me in prayers for his family? Gracious and, and merciful God, God, there are times when, when we ask questions, uh, not unlike the ones we're going to hear in just a moment, but questions of, of why, why so soon? God, why this particular person? And while we don't know all of those answers, we do know that you work in all situations. And so, God, I ask that you would pour out an extra blessing over the Han family. Just give them your peace, your comfort. Show them your love. Just wrap your arms of love around them as they, as they travel this grief journey together. And allow them to truly see the hope, the hope that comes with the resurrection, that hope that we all have. In Jesus' name, amen. And so I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to ask Andy to come forward. Andy's got uh, a list of questions that have been su submitted. However, I'm also going to do something, something else because uh, there were a number of questions that were submitted. There weren't quite as many as last year. If you remember February uh, in 2020, we did this. Uh, and in February 2020, I had a whole lot of questions, and I couldn't get to all of them. And so he actually has some of those questions as well. Uh, but I just, you know, I'm going to say this. If you have a question... 
I'm not saying we'll we'll jump right on it and be able to get it, but once again, if you want to text it to me, I do have my phone. Uh, And so if I I get one, maybe I'll just interrupt uh, Andy and say, well, wait, before you go on to another one, I have a a submitted one here. Uh, And so we'll uh, we'll share those as well as uh, if we can. Uh, And so here's here's a moment for you to get to know Pastor Jared a little more, uh, as well as maybe uh, some of the things going on within the church. Uh, and maybe even some theology questions. And so I hope you enjoy another issue of Ask of the Pastor. So, uh, yes, Andy, the table is yours. All right. We're going to start out a little late. Um, Growing up in Rockford, you know, both of us have that pleasure. Mm -hmm. Um, What did you want to do when you were 13 years old? As a profession. That, uh, as, as a profession, I was about to say, because actually, you know, one of the things I wanted to do was not split my bike in half when I went over a jump. But uh, uh, what did I, you know, I, I think I actually had, had talked about this a, a number of other times. I mean, I really wanted, I wanted to be the, you know, a musician. I wanted to be a professional singer. I, like a lot of teenage boys, I wanted to be the, a rock star, wasn't it? <laughs> Uh, I wanted to be the, you know, for, for me in listening to the music that I was, I was wanting to be the next Michael W. Smith. You know, I, I was going to make it in the Christian music field, and that's where I was going to be. And uh, God, ha- God had other plans. <laughs> and so, thankfully, I just kind of followed along with where, uh, where he was leading. All right. Uh, bit piggybacking off that, what is the difference in the guitars that you play? Uh, mm-hmm. Some have a hole. Some are solid under the strings. How does this affect the sound? Ah. So, uh, so many of you know, I, I just picked up a, a new guitar. It's, a, it's made by Seagull, uh, but it's what they call a dreadnought, uh, and that basically is just the body, sh- the body shape of the guitar. Uh, but the question comes is, is about the sound holes, uh, and so uh, Chris is probably going to correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> uh, but uh, the sound holes in the guitar uh, basically give it the resonance. It comes out of that particular sound hole. The Ovation guitar that I had been playing for a long time, although it didn't look like it had holes, it actually does have holes. There's little feather, like wooden feather pieces at the top uh, and the bottom fronts, and there's smaller holes in there. Uh, And so it it affects the sound. Uh, It comes out a little different out of those little holes. Uh, So out of the larger hole of of a Dreadnought guitar, it gets a little lower resonance. So you can hear some of those lower notes a little easier. Uh, but that's kind of the difference that I've, that I've found and have uh, searched through with, uh, with my guitar playing, my small amount of guitar playing. <laughs> uh, will we hear the new guitar in church on Sunday? Yes. I, I'm trying to remember. I'm looking out here because I'm thinking, all right, which one? Ask that question. Yes. <laughs> yes, we will hear the new one here on a Sunday morning. <laughs> Um, let's go into some theology. Uh, why does God love me? Mm. Wow. Uh, that's a deep question. I mean, that's one of those that, you know, it, I sometimes wonder when questions like that get asked. Uh, where, where people are. Uh, in in their uh, in their life at that moment, uh, and so in in response to that question, I mean nobody really. I mean we don't know the mind of God. Uh, I I don't know that there's a way that we can truly fully know the mind of God. What we know about God is revealed to us, uh, and it's revealed to us in a, in a few different ways. Uh, the way we know God and who God is is revealed through Scripture. And through the word. Now, I use the, those two words separately because uh, Scripture is the Bible. Uh, sometimes people will call the Bible; they'll call it the Word of God. Uh, we even respond in our Scripture reading uh, about uh, you know hearing and understanding the Word of God. Uh, the Word of God is Jesus Christ. Uh, and so if you really want to get at what the Word of God is, we need to look at, at who Jesus was. And so for me, uh, knowing who God is, is is revealed to us through Scripture and through Jesus Christ. Uh, and so if you look at Scripture, there's all kinds of passages. You know, Genesis talks about God creating, uh, God creating humankind. Uh, and he creates all of creation and says it's good. 
But then he creates humankind. And you remember what he says about it, about humankind? It's very good. It isn't just good. It's very good. Uh, We hear passages in Psalms. Psalm 139 tells us that, that we are wonderfully created, beautifully and wonderfully created. Uh, God loved us first. The passage out of 1 John says we love because God loved us first. I mean, there are passages throughout Scripture that, that we hear, and probably the, the favorite one of everyone is John 3.16. God so loved the world and not just the world. Yes, He loves His creation, but God loves all of us. Uh, And so, we hear this throughout Scripture, uh, that God does love us. And why does God love us? God created us. We are created in God's image. Uh, And so, sometimes people ask, well, what is the image of God? Uh, and, And for me, the image of God is love. You know, it, we, we try to put human bodies on things because that's what we understand. Uh, you know, we start looking at things going, okay, well, what does God look like? Well, God looks like this person or that person, you know, because that's all we know. We can't fathom uh, who God truly is in his entirety. Uh, but we know that the image of God is love. Uh, and so I think that's, you know, because he created us, because God created us in his image, this is why God loves us. And I, and I hope that whoever uh, submitted that question knows just how much God loves you, and God cares for you, and, and God wants nothing but the best for you. You know, Jeremiah tells us, God says, yeah, I got plans for you. <laughs> I got plans for each and every one of you, and they're plans to prosper, uh, and that's what God's desire is for you. All right. Uh, let's go to a Journey of Hope question. Uh, would you again offer whole church tour, tours for those who were not able to attend one before Wesley and Epworth emerged? Absolutely. I think that's a great idea uh, to do a couple more full church tours because actually I think there, there might be a few people, uh, in fact, you might want to raise your hand. If there are people in here that, uh, that joined after the merger, uh, or kind of in the process. Yeah, there's, I, I see some hands. Yeah. Uh, I felt like I was going to a different church there for a second. Yes, I see that hand. Uh, but, uh, but yes, I mean, there's some people that, that haven't been through the whole church and have been members for a few months now. Uh, and so, I, I think that would be a great idea to, to show people how, how many of you actually know that we have a lower level beho- below the sanctuary. <laughs> you know, that might come as a surprise to some people. It's like, okay, yeah, there's a whole lower level down below here that, uh, that we do hope and pray that we will be using uh, very shortly. So, yes, we will. Are uh, you going to lead those tours? I could. <laughs> I've been in every part of the building. Um, uh, what Bible does this church use in worship and why? This, okay, so when I first arrived, I... Uh, when I first arrived, the, the Bible that we were using, we were reading from the Common English Bible, uh, which is relatively new. Uh, it, it's, it's really kind of an easy, easier read of Scripture. Uh, personally, I actually I read the ESV, which is the English Standard Version, uh, and the reason I do that is that it's as close to the original Greek as I've been able to find, especially through seminary. Uh, the problem is, is that it's sometimes clunky to read. So when we stand up here and try to read it in, in, uh, in, in church, it, it, it doesn't sound or flow quite as nice. We actually have been reading now for a little while, we've been reading the NIV, the New, in, New International Version. Uh, and, uh, and so there's a lot of churches that will read Common English or New Revised Standard, ver- uh, yeah, New Revised Standard Version, uh, but we've, I just kind of chose the, the NIV because it's, it's kind of easy to hear uh, and easier to read. Uh, and it doesn't, doesn't quite go all the way to the common English. So that's, that's what we do. Actually, I've got a uh, question that was texted in. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, so uh, I, I won't call out your name because it, since you texted me the question, I, I know who sent this one. <laughs> uh, but, so the question is, did that beautiful new altar behind you come from Wesley? Yes. Is that not beautiful? You know? Yeah. 
and, uh, and, it's, and it's modular. Uh, the two end pieces can come off. Uh, it's, it, it actually, it's on casters, so we can move it around. Uh, but yes, uh, absolutely beautiful. We weren't really sure how close the wood would match to the back of the, the wall of the wood of this sanctuary here, but I think it complements it very well. Uh, and so uh, you can, you'll actually see that the, that the old Epworth altar is right here. It's actually holding the TV up right now. <laughs> Uh, and just in case you want to ask a question about that, uh, it won't be too long before the TV moves to make it a little easier for everybody to see because it'll go up here. Uh, so it'll be in the middle uh, and we'll be up there sometime, uh, but it, it will be moving. So, little history on the wall. Um, that came from my grandma and grandpa's uh, memorial. Oh, the wood wall? The wood wall, yes. Very nice. So... Uh, Yes. Yeah, and everything else matches. So you got the wall, the, the podium, the baptismal font, and the welcome center. All kind of tie in the same wood. Yep. All right. With Father's Day coming, it brings to mind the impact our Almighty Father has on our lives. What has been the most impactful lesson you have learned from your dad, and what do you feel is one of the important lessons you have taught your daughters? Hmm. Uh, so the one thing that I, I joke with my father about uh, is, is uh, and actually Sherry and I have talked about this a number of times, about how, how my dad, I always classified him as, him as a workaholic, uh, and he passed that gene down to me. Uh, so, uh, but I'm not sure that's quite what you're going for there. Uh, let's see. I, I reflected on quite a bit of this actually uh, yesterday as, uh, as we shared the celebration of life for Michael Hahn. Uh, and hearing his his kids talk, uh, and how he uh, how he had lived his life, and and I'm rem reminded of of maybe not so much the words that my father spoke, uh, but the actions, and the way my father always held himself. Uh, he was kind of this guy that was just smooth over everything, you know. There w there wasn't a lot of things that uh, that would upset him that would send him off in a, in a rage anywhere. Uh, it was just very easy going. Uh, but one of the pieces that, uh, that I hope that I have picked up from him uh, is his, uh, not his extrovertness, uh, because I know I'm not that. I know that's a shock to some of you. Uh, but his, his uncanny way of making friends. Uh, he could make a friend with anyone. Uh, and so, so just a an example of that, uh, we moved into a house on Lawndale uh, in Rockford, Illinois, and uh, it wasn't but a, a week after we had moved in, I think, that, uh, that our next door neighbor uh, had an old car dropped off uh, and was working, I think it could have been, even been on a, pulling an engine out or, or dropping a tranny on it, and, uh, and so the neighbor jumps out there and he's just all dirty and grimy and he's got music blasting out of the garage I think and and he's working on the car in the backyard not the pleasant of sights that you want to see from a backyard uh, and my dad comes out and without missing a beat finds his coveralls and goes next door and says what are you doing can I help and it, it was just at the right time uh, neighbor Carl was like absolutely you know, help. And, and so they, he started helping him with the work on the car, and the friendship just blossomed right there. Uh, and they had been friends, uh, well, that would have been early 80s. Yeah, early 80s, and they just met up with them a couple of weeks ago. They're getting ready to move to Portland, Oregon, my, my parents' friends are. Uh, and they wanted to get together and just share some time before they left. You know, and he, and he, he wrote in this beautiful letter about how, uh, basically explaining that story and how no one, he could not picture anybody else doing that. And he says, but that's just who you were. You know, and that's who my dad was. You go up to Briggsville and you go down Golden Lane and stop at any door on Golden Lane and say, hey, do you know who Jerry Severing is? And I bet every one of them will say, yeah. And you know what? He'll give the shirt off his back to you. He will help you do things that, that he probably shouldn't be doing. Uh, <laughs> But he's going he's gonna to go out and do it anyway. Uh, and so I hope that, you know, that that has been instilled with, within me and that that is one of those lessons that, that both my daughters have picked up as well is that, you know, you just help whenever it's needed. 
You know, if somebody needs something, you just do it. You don't necessarily ask, you know, what, what's it going to cost me? How much time is this going to take? You just, just go out and do it. Uh, I mean, because you know what? When all is said and done in this life, the relationships are the most important thing, you know? And I think God really had that in mind when, when he blessed marriages, for you two back there, uh, when he blessed marriages, uh, when he blessed friendships, uh, this is what it's about. It's about us living in community, you know, especially us here in this church. All right. Um, now that we are mainly back in, to in-person worship, it seems like there is a divide between two churches, us versus them. What do we need to do to get past this and become just a journey of hope? Mm. Yeah, so whoever asked that question, <laughs> uh, that means that, that people are noticing. Uh, and, and that is, so the pandemic was a blessing and a curse uh, in many different ways. But within the merger, the pandemic was a blessing and a curse. Uh, it was a blessing because uh, it really kind of helped us kind of push through, and we were able to merge, and we were able to do that in, in record time. Uh, I mean, I don't know of another church merger that has happened that quickly, and during a pandemic. I mean, there's a lot of, we're actually going to be featured uh, in annual conference. Uh, somebody wanted us to talk about it. Uh, so it was a wonderful thing to do. Uh, the hard part was that we never had the chance to be together like we, we are right now. Uh, and so now that we're coming back together, now some of those, some of those feelings are coming out. Uh, and while I, while I naively thought that, that that would never happen, that it would never come out that way, uh, I guess deep down I, I realized that sooner or later something would be said. Uh, some, some group would be, it would be together and others f would feel like they were excluded. Uh, and, so, and so I guess what, uh, what I would say to all of us here and all of, all of us watching at home uh, is that there was a passage in, in Scripture when, uh, when a couple of the disciples were talking to Jesus and they were saying, well, hey, you know what? Uh, I think it was about the time they were saying, who's going to be on Jesus' right and Jesus' left-hand side? And, and there were all kinds of questions about, about this and about what was happening. And, and Jesus said, you know what? You've heard about all of the people around you and how they work within their communities and within, within governments or whatever. And he turns to him and he says, you know what they're like. It is not so with you. You know, so he, he turns to his disciples and says, I don't care what, everyth what everything else is going on about how people divide, whether that's politically or spiritually or, or, or whatever it may be. It's not to be that way with you. And so how do we get past it? And I think really that's kind of a question that I need to throw out to all of you because I can say, you know, we're going to try this or we're going to try that. You know, we're going to do the trailhead where we get everybody together and, and try to have people have conversations about who they are. Uh, and, uh, but I think a lot of this comes down to each and every one of you. Each and every one of you welcoming everyone else regardless of, of what church they belong to before the merger or after or whatever, you know, it, it's just kind of saying, you're all welcome. If we need to find huge spaces to, to put everybody in, uh, then so be it. But let's all get together as one church family. Let's, let's uh, figure out how this works, you know, especially as, you know, because, I, okay, I, I really probably should acknowledge that that within the merger, I mean, it, was, uh, it wasn't kind of the vital merger that a lot of us are, are used to hearing the words of because it wasn't two churches coming together, uh, getting a new pastor, a new building, uh, you know, so everything ends up being new. Uh, there's, there still is this, could be this feeling of, well, one church merged into another, and so, so Epworth, we're still in Epworth's building, and we're still with Epworth's pastor, and so, uh, and so there may be a feeling in, in some that say, you know, we lost a lot. And let me say this, 
You did. I mean, there's, there's a whole building that's on South Street that we're not in. Uh, and so while we are trying our best to, to do all we can, you know, trying to bring other pieces of worship in, uh, I also know that it's not, it's not going to always, it's not going to be what you were used to. Now, for those of you from Epworth, you also know that, uh, that as things change, that, that the worship service changed as well. And so some of the Epworth people are going, yeah, hey, yeah, you lost some things too. Didn't lose the building. Uh, so there is still, there's still grief there that we need to acknowledge. Uh, and that's, that's going to get better with time. Uh, and I think it's going to get better as, as we all come together and share each other's stories. You know, share stories about the Wesley building. You know, share stories about your life. Share stories about the ministry that, that you were in. But it's going to be up to all of us. It's not going to be up to the ad board, the ad council. Sorry. <laughs> it's not going to be up to trustees or finance or any of the other committees. It's about all of you getting involved and getting to know each other. It'll take a little bit of time. But I do have hope that we will get there. Because I see glimpses of it. All right. If that wasn't a deep enough question, here's another one. Um, do you believe in hell, everlasting turmoil for sinners by an all-loving God? <laughs> I love that. I think that was a really deep question. I thought you were going to something really light. <laughs> do you believe in hell? Oh, man. I, so just so you know, I, I do have a couple of notes written down on some of the theological questions because I, I didn't want to miss something. So, I, so, so what is hell? You know, and we could ask that question. And I think if I ask that question of all of you, there's going to be so many different answers to that question. You know, what is hell? Is there a hell? What, what does it look like? Does it look like uh, <laughs> there was a, a theologian that, that would express hell as being uh, this place where God would dangle sinners over the fiery pits of hell? And the end of your question goes, you know, it's talking about do you believe about in this when we have an all-loving God? And I've got, a, I've got a real problem with God dangling sinners over a fiery lake. Uh, I said, that just, that does not sound like a loving God to me. Uh, I did have a professor uh, that would talk about this every once in a while. Uh, and he was asking, you know, okay, so what, what could hell be? Could hell, okay, yes, it could be this fiery place. Uh, what else could hell be? What if hell is complete and total separation from God. That, that could be hell. A complete and total separation from God. May not be flames, fiery. I mean, it's been pretty hot this past week, but, uh, but it may not be that. I mean, it may just be the separation from God. And, and so... It, Who's going to be there? What's going to be there? I, I, I'm not the judge. And thankfully, I am not the judge. I, I just can't see uh, an all-loving God desiring people to be in hell. I just can't see this. I mean, we hear Jesus in the, in the book of Revelation say, I hold the keys to hell and death. Hell has no power over Jesus Christ. Uh, and so, Jesus says that the gates are open. I got the key. So does that mean people have to be there? Will some choose to turn away from God? Uh, unfortunately, yes. Unfortunately, yes. I mean, we, we, see, it, we see it in the world around us. Uh, and so it, I believe there, there, is, uh, there is some place. Uh, is it always going to be that way? That's where I start to get a little gray gray in my head because <laughs> it's, it enters into this little gray area of saying, okay, if Jesus holds the key to hell and death and there are some that choose to turn away from God and end up in this place, uh, is there a moment where there is redemption for those that say, I get it now. 
I get it. And, I, and they repent, and Jesus is holding the keys going, okay, the gate's not there anymore. Wouldn't that be a beautiful sight? To have everyone finally be redeemed? Uh, there are some I'm, I, I know that <laughs> we'll just acknowledge that there, there are some out there that we kind of wonder, I, I don't know. But once again, we are not the judge. So, Let's talk about some of your favorites. Uh, <laughs> your favorite book. Uh, favorite book. You know, for, for the longest time, it has been The Shack. Uh, the Shack was a really good book uh, as far as, like, Christian fiction. Uh, love that one. Uh, as far as other books, love uh, David Baldacci. Uh, David Baldacci writes a one a really good mystery thrillers. Uh, and the other author that I love is uh, uh, William Kent Kruger. If you ever get a chance to pick up any of his books, uh, he writes a lot about, uh, actually a lot about the Dakotas, uh, Boundary Waters, Minnesota, uh, a lot of areas up there, but he's a Christian writer. Uh, his, one of, his, the book that I got introduced for him was Ordinary Grace. Ordinary Grace is a, is a book about baseball, uh, but it's just a, it, it reminds me of the movie Stand By Me. So, I Favorite think, trip. Hmm? Favorite trip. Favorite trip. Okay, two. Uh, because it's hard to choose one. Uh, favorite trip when I was younger with my parents was Yellowstone. Going out to Yellowstone National Park. That was just a phenomenal trip to go out there and see all of that. Uh, and then favorite trip number two was uh, a little while ago, Sherry and I were able to go on a cruise with my parents and, and brothers uh, and just spending time away and uh, on a really big ship with endless amounts of food was really good. <laughs> I think we have, uh, we have time for maybe two more. Okay. Oh. Uh, two more? Yeah. Okay. Uh, actually, two light ones, because I just thought about this. We have communion. Ah, <laughs> no problem. Uh, well, I know you wanted this one to be asked. Um, where'd it go? Um, if the split is voted on, and how do you perceive which direction we will go? Uh, okay, so the split that he's talking about, uh, for those of you who, uh, who might have been under a rock for a number of years, uh, the split that he's talking about is within the United Methodist Church. General Conference 2022 uh, is coming. It was supposed to be, uh, supposed to be 2020, supposed to be 2021, now it's 2022. Uh, and in that moment, they're going to decide on the future of the United Methodist Church. Uh, and whether or not there's a split in the denomination. Uh, and so, unfortunately, uh, what I will say is this. First of all, I hope that it doesn't. I, it's really hard to call the United Methodist Church a United Methodist Church when there's going to go two different ways. Uh, plus, this is God's church, not our church. Uh, with that being said, I'm also not naive to think that it's not going to happen. So, uh, I see something on the horizon uh, what that's going to mean for us, I don't know right now. But I do know this. We're going to travel that journey together. Uh, as a family of faith, we're going to travel that journey. So we're going to have conversations. We're going to try to figure out what, what it is for us. Uh, and then we will make decisions based on that. Uh, but we're also going to do it with love. We're going to do it with grace. And we're going to do it with respect. With, for each other. Uh, because I know looking out across this congregation and uh, some of the members that aren't here right now, we are not all on the same political side. We are not all on the same side of this particular issue. Uh, although the issue really isn't the issue that we're fighting about, it's really something else. Uh, because really it, it boils down to not necessarily the, the surface level issue. It really is the issue of our interpretation of Scripture and how we look at Scripture. Uh, and so, uh, eventually that is coming. Uh, I would love to tell you that it's not. Uh, and so, I would also tell us that we have a lot of work to do. And so, we will go through it, but we will go through it together. Uh, and, and we will love and care for each other every step of the way. Okay? Thank you. Uh, yeah.